So we're going to go ahead. Um, let me share again because I know we had stopped sharing. All right. So with competency six, we know this is all about grammar and also writing. Right. And we know with learning grammar skills, we want it in context. We, would, we don't want to be teaching in isolation. That has been a theme that we have been saying over and over and over again. All right. So we have about six review questions and then we're going to move on to um, learning about digraphs. Okay. We're going to go to the questions in competency six and then from there go to competency seven. All right. So question one, what might be the, what might be the best, so I would highlight best, method for informally assessing students' writing, development, and skills? So informally, meaning this is not going to be like a formal test, this is informal. These keywords are important. So create a rule that mistakes on class uh, class work can always be corrected for extra credit and we're looking at what is the best method for informally assessing students writing development and skills b make time for journaling in class during which the students can write freely without being graded on mechanics spelling or structure C, create a class website upon which students can write content and post comments to one another. Occasionally, ask the students, other teachers, how they are doing with writing assignments. So we can already see like D makes absolutely no sense. So occasionally, if you're occasionally doing something and it's not something that living and breathing in your classroom, then it's not going to help assess students' writing development and skills. Because in order to really assess it, it has to be something that's living and breathing in your classroom. So the word occasionally stuck out for me and I was like, you know what, that's not going to work. So D is out. Create a class website upon which students can write content and post comments to one another. Once again, what is it assessing? Because we said, even though this is informal, is it assessing their students' writing development and skills? And what yeah. are these skills? We know this is competency six, so we're talking about grammar. We're talking about mechanics. B, make time for journaling in class during which students can freely uh, free, uh, write freely without being graded on mechanics, spelling, or structure. Once again, this is an informal, that should be highlighted, this is an informal way to assess students' writing, development, and skills, right? And these skills are mechanics, spelling, and structure. A, create a rule that mistakes on classwork can always be corrected for extra credit. This is focusing too much on the mistakes, and there's not enough emphasis on development of their skills. Right? So B is the only one that makes sense. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yes. Um, so I do want to read a little bit about the rationale. So because writing is an ongoing developmental process, so I would highlight writing is an ongoing developmental process, it is important to monitor students' development in various ways over time. During journal time, students can write freely without concern for being graded on various aspects of their work. This freedom will likely enhance their willingness to explore their ideas. This process allows the teacher to understand which rules of co uh, conventional writing have carried over into the student's long-term memories, right? So as she's reading the journal, she's able to see if they have mastered spelling or mastered periods or commas, right? Ideally, students will continually add new writing skills to their free journaling, indicating that writing instruction is improving. Because once again, this is something that is a developmental process. Students should be improving over time. Improving their skills without the students needing to consciously apply them. Journaling also allows students to practice that which they have learned without paying undue attention to parameters for grading. There goes that informal piece. All right, so here um, we have kind of like a three-part question, so we're going to take this slow. 
So using the information, the following information to answer questions 60 through 61. So this is an excerpt from a student, okay? So dear grandma, hello, how you doing? How are grandpa and Daisy? Daisy is such a cute dog. She is growing up really fast. I just started my middle school last month. I stay late on Tuesdays and Thursdays so I can practice with the team and go to meetings. I wasn't too sure how it would work out for me when I started. There is a lot more homework and lots of new older kids. But I'm starting to get used to the homework and have met some cool new friends. I'm really looking forward to visiting you and grandpa during Thanksgiving. I also joined the soccer team in the drama club. Thank you so much for the art set you sent me for my birthday. I have already used it to do some sketches and some sculpting. Please make the pumpkin pie that I like so much. Okay, that's about all I have to say right now. Write me back if you can. I'll see you. Love, Chris. All right, so go through this again and note the errors that you're seeing, right? So note any like grammar issues that you're seeing. Let me know when you're ready to go to the next slide. Okay. 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 A sixth grade class is instructed to write letters to family members describing daily life that will be sent out via the post office. The teacher notices several writing errors that are common across the writing sample. If this letter is a primary example of these writing errors, which set is most salient? So basically, like, which set is, like, the most obvious? right? Um, so we have a sixth grade class is instructed to write letters to family members describing daily life that uh, will be sent out via the post office. The teacher notices several writing errors that are common across writing samples. If this letter is a primary example of these writing errors, which set is most salient? A, organization of ideas, capitalization and punctuation, B, contraction, punctuation, and writing style. C, capitalization, spelling, and use of passive voice. So remember when they're talking about passive voice, it's like, she was going. It's not direct. Like with active voice, is she's going, right? Writing style, organization of ideas, and use of active voice. So we have here, let's go back. So, dear grandma, hello, how are you doing? So this right here, from the beginning, we have some capitalization errors, some punctuation, right? How are mm -hmm. you doing? How are grandpa and Daisy? Daisy is such a cute dog. She is growing up really fast. I just started middle school last month. I stay late on Tuesday. So here we have some spelling errors. Mm -hmm. So I can practice with the team. This is some capitalization area. So we know team should be lowercase and go to meetings. Um, so it's like, how are you doing? Okay, so I, I don't know about you, but I'm very confused with this letter. I feel like he's all over the place. First, he's mm -hmm. asking them how he's doing. Um, like, how's grandma doing? How's grandpa and Daisy? And then he talks about how Daisy's such a cute dog. 
Then he jumps to middle school last month and how he stays late Tuesdays and Thursdays so he can practice with the team and go to meetings. I wasn't how sh I wasn't sure how it would work out for me when I started there. So here we go, capitalization. But we're just, what, maybe five sentences in and he's talked about like five different topics. Um, there's a lot more homework and lots of new older kids, but I'm starting to get used to the homework and have met some cool new friends. I'm really looking forward to visiting you and grandpa doing Thanksgiving. Okay, so he talks about Thanksgiving. Let's see what this next sentence is about. I also joined the soccer team in the drama club. Thank you so much for the art set you sent me for my birth. Oh, wow. He got a lot of stuff going on in his life. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of to do some sketches and some sculpting. Then he goes back to pumpkin pie that I like so much. Okay, so organization is definitely um, something we need to focus on. Uh, that 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 goes without saying. So organization, we got to have it. So we have contractions, punctuation, and writing style. I don't think writing style really applies here. I mean, he is writing like um, someone would in, in sixth grade. Um, what do you think? We know um, I, basic ideas I, is definitely one we need to focus on. Correct. And I, and I feel like he has some punctuation errors. Yeah. I also feel like he has some um, capitalization errors. Yes. Definitely capitalization. I saw a few capitalization errors. So oh. with that, I'm leaning at A, right? Organization oh. of ideas. Um, contractions wasn't really an issue. Um, I feel like he was basically in active voice. Like he didn't switch back and forth. Um, you know, basically his, like, the key word here is most salient, most obvious issues, right? Because we can pick, we can nitpick at other things, but organization of ideas, capitalization, and punctuation is definitely the most obvious here. So yes, A, this letter is difficult to follow because it is not organized according to main ideas and supporting sentences. Right. The letter also displays inconsistent capitalization and punctuation within the body. Um, so in choice B, the reference to writing style is vague and can be viewed subjectively. Teachers are responsible for teaching writing conventions. However, it is important to teach proper grammar without criticizing the student's specific ideas or their style of writing. So like talking about their style of writing, that's not as important as making sure their ideas are coming across correctly. Hi, Abigail. Abigail, this is 4th through 8th ELA. So I'm in the wrong one. Um, which session are you are you here for? Uh, the ELR, 4th through 8th? Yes, you're here. You're, you're in the right session. Welcome, welcome. Okay, good. We are um, on competency six. So just going over some questions and the keywords and everything like that. I'm so glad you could join us. This session is actually being recorded, so you will be able to go back and review it. Perfect. Okay. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. So then we have, um, we're going to move on to question three, because I think we got the gist of question two and one. Good job. Um, so which lesson would not be helpful in addressing the primary issues in the student's writing? So would not be helpful. So we know the issues that he, you know, did have, right? Um, we knew organization was an issue, punctuation and capitalization, right? So keeping that in mind, which lesson would not be helpful? So take some time to read the question and then tell me what you think. Um, uh, pertaining to him and his writing, I don't think um, C would okay. be. Okay, 
Yeah. It'll be, I, I feel like it would be least helpful because he didn't have any problems with, you know. With passive, passive or passive. active voice. Exactly. Cool. So absolutely, C would be correct. We already identified from the last question that organization, punctuation, and capitalization were the primary issues. So with that being said, we wouldn't want to focus on passive or active voice. And just kind of going back to whatever, to what that is. So mm -hmm. passive voice refers to the overuse of the word to be. She was going to the store. She was doing this. She was doing that, right? So we typically want to stay away from passive, but this student actually did a really good job of using active voice. He just mm -hmm. struggled with capitalization and punctuation and organization of ideas. He talked about right. 10 different ideas. Okay. Yeah. Nice work. All right. So, Abigail, what we're doing, we're reading the question. I'm going to be pulling out those key words, and then um, I'm going to mm -hmm. have y'all read the answer choices and then just tell me which one do you think is correct based off of our discussion. All right. Okay. So, Miss Trent plans to create a rubric that will help her grade her middle schoolers writing samples. So Ms. Trent plans to create a rubric that will help her grade her middle schoolers writing sample. All right, she wants to make sure that she is consistent across time and between various students who write with different styles. Which of the following would be most important for her to do in order to help build her students writing skills? So we have A, be sure to include every possible aspect of the writing process so that no detail is left out as different students have different strengths. So what I would <laughs> highlight here, be sure to include every possible aspect of the writing process so that no detail is left out. Think about if we want that for the writing process for kids. B, share the rubric with students so that they can monitor their own understanding of the writing process as they complete their assignments. C, use clear, simple language so that there is no confusion at a later date about what was intended. Think about if that's the, the primary use of a rubric. Why do we use a rubric? Why is it important? Divide each segment of the rubric into its own category and assign equal point values, the purpose of which will be to help students understand that each aspect of the writing process is of equal value. So we have to understand that some of these answer choices, even though like it's not the most important, it is important. But the key word that we have to look here at this question is most important because you, some of these answer choices, yes, um, the rubric is important, but is it most important, right? That is what we got to focus on. So which of the following would be most important for her to, her to do in order to help build her students' writing skills? Okay, is it just about the process is it, or is it about the student understanding their own writing process as they complete their assignments? Or is the rubric intended just for clear, simple language so there's no confusion? Or is the rubric intended to just divide each segment of the rubric so it has its own category? Is it just intended for them to be able to just break the parts down and say, oh, all of these have five points that go with them. They're of equal mm. value. What is the rubric really intended for? right? So knowing that, what are the two answer choices you would remove immediately? I'm going to remove D. Okay. And I'm going to also remove C. Mm. Yes, I agree. Yep. Okay. So we agree there. Absolutely. So now we got to really be intentional about our next answer choice because we're down to two. And this is just how it is on the real test, right? So be sure to include every possible aspect of the writing process so that no detail is left out as different students have different strengths. So I think with A, it starts off good, but then when you read the, the rest, it, it starts uh -huh. to become 
a little weird. I'm like, I right. don't see the connection here. And that's what mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to. Answer choices that start off right, and then you stop reading. And then you're like, okay, this is right. It has the key words. And then you go back and read, and you're like, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense. So when you have two answer choices and they both look really right, go back and read both of them very carefully because there are going to be some key words where you're like, okay, be sure to include every possible aspect of the writing process so that no detail is left out. Okay, I can see that with the rubric. They're able to go through the writing process. Great. As different students have different strengths, it lost me with that part. It lost me with that because that does not make sense with what a rubric does. It does, yeah. It's not about that. So then we move mosey all down to B. Right. Share the rubric with students so that they can monitor their own understanding of the writing process as they complete their assignment. Yes. This makes sense to me, right? They're able to monitor their own understanding because everything is broken down because we know like a rubric is broken down by, okay, convention and organization and um we have the voice so it's broken down by those different components so they can monitor their own understanding so with that it would be b right so let's kind of dig a little bit deeper as to why so writing is a complex subjective process which will never be graded identically amongst teacher teachers the best teachers, however, know that students write more clearly and more accurately when they know that which is expected of them. So in choice A, the inclusion of so many details may be confusing and causes the grading process to take too long. So if you have too many details in the rubric, it might confuse students, right? Um, C is certainly an important action to consider, but will probably not directly affect the student's writing skills. So when we're talking about C, use clear, simple language. Once again, we do want to use clear, simple language, but it is not the most important for students to build their writing. Okay, so I think we got it. Let's move on. Question five. All of the following approaches are important for building students' writing skills in conjunction with one another, except. So here we go. So all of the following approaches are important for building. So I would highlight approaches are important for building students' writing skills in conjunction with one another, except. So we're looking for what it is not. We have discussing the various purposes for writing, including self-expression, narration, storytelling, persuasion, and explanation. B, exercises and activities that isolate and build students' writing skills, including grammar, spelling, me mechanics. C, creating multiple and various opportunities for students to feel more at ease with the process, diminishing fear or discomfort with it. D, maintaining a sequential approach to teaching writing, allowing all students to excel at one level or in one context before moving on to another. All right. So we have with this one, all of the following approaches are important for building students' writing skills in conjunction with one another. So exercises and activities that isolate and build students' writing skills, including grammar, spelling, mechanics, a, discussing the various purposes for writing. C, creating multiple and various opportunities. D, maintaining a sequential approach to teaching writing, allowing all students to excel at one level or in one context before moving on to another. So what do we think? Take some time to look at this. I'll be right back. Okay. Hi, Mom. And then I'm in a zone thing. So I would say 
Um, with A, discussing the various purposes for writing, including self-expression, narration. I think that is important when we're talking about building writing skills. If your students yes. are able to see a mentor text of narration, then they're more likely to be able to do it themselves. Correct. B, exercises and activities that isolate and build students' writing skills, including grammar, spelling mechanics. So I'm looking at B. I know we know um, exercise and activities that isolate. Is I'm not a, a big fan of it. Isolation. Isolation, right? But we might want to keep reading because um, there might be one that's even more like ridiculous, right? So let's keep going. Creating multiple and various opportunities for students to feel more at ease with the process, diminishing fear and discomfort with it. So we know with this um, competency, we want to create multiple and various opportunities for students, right? The more they practice, the more at ease they will be with it. D, maintaining a sequential approach to teaching writing. Okay, so this part is good. Maintaining a sequential approach to teaching writing allowing all students to excel at one level or in one context before moving on to another. I think D, even though we know it's B, if you, we don't wanna teach things in isolation, but I feel like D might be the most um, out of there as far as um, helping students to build writing skills because we know like we have a process with writing right but it says allowing all students to excel at one level or in one context before moving on to another the thing with writing everybody's no one is ever going to be at at the same level at the same time you have some students it takes them a while to brainstorm and others who are ready to move on to the drafting process within the first day Right, so to expect everybody to master each skill all at the same time, I think is a bit much, right? right? So because of that, even though we know B, teaching, exercise, and activities in isolation is not the best method, if they're building writing skills, including grammar, spelling, and mechanics, that's going to help them develop their writing skills, right? That's okay. what saved B. But D, expect a sequential approach. Yes, we do teach it in a certain order, but that last part, allowing our students to excel at one level or in one context before moving on to another, that's not necessarily realistic because everybody learns writing at different times. At different, yes. Okay, so that's, that, that was my two cents with that. So let's talk mm -hmm. about it. So writing is a skill that evolves over time because it is so complex and involves multiple skill sets. Because so many skills are important in writing, it is impossible to apply the same sequence to each new writer, right? You have some students, they thrive in the rough draft stage, and then you have some students, they thrive in the editing stage, right? It's just everybody has their different parts. That's writing. Uh, choice A is important for all writers beginning to advance since writing, like reading, is a skill that we'll use across many contexts, meaning we want to know what good writing looks like and sounds like so students will be able to apply it. Choice B gives students practice with the various aspects of the writing process that often prove difficult for new writers. So when we're talking about B, exercises and activities, that build on grammar, spelling, and mechanics. We know even as adults, uh, mechanics and grammar, that's very difficult. So if you can provide exercises that build on that, that's gonna be very helpful to students, right? Um, choice D, it says, um, so choice D, students can diminish their fear or lack of motivation for writing because they will be able to explore it in a variety of ways. Choice D, however, may create the problem of boredom for more advanced students and cause writing progress to be slow for those who are still learning. So maintaining a sequential approach, we know, like I gave that example, for advanced writers, those who are ready to keep moving 
and then we slow them down to wait on everybody before we move on to the next part, that could be very frustrating and really mess up their writing process. Sometimes you just have to let things flow. All right, moving on to six. Um, so we have, what is the primary grammatical problem with this student's paragraph? Um, each of the kids in our, in our class loves to play games. Our favorite game, hide and go seek, are fun and easy to play anywhere you go. The people in our class really enjoys getting to spend time with friends. So we wanna look at this. What is the primary grammatical problem with this student's paragraph? Remember when we went through all those different grammar sections, right? When we were talking about active voice, adjective placement, subject verb agreement, knowing that if you're talking about, if you have a singular verb, then you need a singular subject. Everything needs to match. Each of the kids in our class love to play games. Our favorite game, hide and go seek, are fun and easy to play anywhere you go. The people in our class really enjoy getting to spend time with friends. So look at this and tell me which one of these answer choices make the most sense. What is the primary grammatical problem here? I want to go with a uh, subject verb agreement. Subject verb agreement? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So with this one, it is subject verb agreement, right? Absolutely. So if we look at some of the things that um we need to focus on each of the kids in our class love to play games this part right here that's an issue our favorite game how to go see are fun so that's a problem the people in our class really enjoys so we know people it should be say really enjoy not enjoys right so it would be subject verb agreement so in the now, what is what? in the, in the um, answer choices? What was the what was split in sentences? So we're gonna read this and go through it. No worries. Okay. So in the first sentence, the compound uh, subject of the sentence is each of the kids. This compound subject with the propositional phrase of the kids may trick students into thinking that the subject is plural, making the verb love but based on the singular subject each the verb should be loves in the second sentence the subject game should change the verb to is instead of the plural are in the third sentence that uh, the subject is compound with the prepositional phrase in our class but the verb should be singular in joy the punctuation suggested in choice a and the word choice in choice c is correct in the uh, paragraph. There are no split infinitives. Split infinitives, oh my God, you know what? I thought they were gonna have a decent rationale, but they don't. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about it because they don't have it. All right, so when we talk about split infinitive, a construct, oh, let me make sure you can see it. So a split infinitive, all right? Um, a construction consisting of an infinitive with an adverb or other word inserted between two and the verb. Example, she seems to really like it, right? So when you see people, she seems, so we have the adverb or other word inserted between two and the verb. She seems to really like it so we have like as the verb in two here that's like an example of split infinitives um so let me give you another example an infinitive consists of the word to in the simple form of a verb to go to read this is an infinitive so to go to read to suddenly go and to quickly read are examples of split infinitives because the adverbs, which are suddenly, quickly, split, or break up the infinitives to go and to read. Do that make sense? Like they just add that extra to in there when it's yes. really not needed. It's really like extra words. Split okay. infinitives. 
All right. So the next one, let's see. So we're pretty much done with competency six with those questions. Next, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the vowel digraphs. So you will have maybe one or two questions over vowel digraphs, and I wanna make sure that we got it. So vowel digraphs are a combination of vowels that combine to make a single vowel sound. So the OA in boat, okay? It, it makes that O sound, right? And you'll notice with vowel digraphs, the first vowel normally gets that long uh, sound that you hear. So you don't hear the sound A, right? You don't hear that. You hear the long O, right? All right, so um, the same thing with rain. What is the vowel that you hear? The A sound, right? That's the long A. Or the double E in feet. Or the EA in C, right? If it doesn't follow that rule of the, the first vowel is the long sound that you hear, then it's not a vowel digraph. So it needs to have two vowels that make a single vowel sound. And it also needs to follow that rule of whatever vowel comes first gets that sound, okay? Um, then we have the diphthong, okay? So I wanted us to watch a quick video. You know, I love visuals. And we'll go over one other, and I think we should be good to um, do the rest of the questions. O for float, coat, boat, toast, soap. A for bread, thread, head, wealth, dead. E for meat, beak, beach, seat, leaf. L for sale, male, snail, tail, pail. A for paint, waist, aid, chain, aim. L for south, cloud, shout, crouch, flower. Oi for oink, coins, oil, Noise, soil. Oi for toy. Soy, ahoy, oi, joy. And they kind of just, I thought this video was effective because it gives you all of the, the different examples and it gives you those vowel teams. So on your- uh, for vault. Launch. Okay. Exactly. So on your own time, it'll be embedded like this PowerPoint will be uploaded to the Google Classroom. So you'll be able to go and see all those examples and make um, cards out of them if you would like. So let's see. Want to give the gift of reading? So let me go back. All right. So now what I want us to do is go through um, competency six on certified teacher. Certified teacher really gives you those rigorous questions. I know y'all hear me say that all the time that are going to be um, helpful to us. So let me go ahead and pull it up. So we didn't get to competency seven today, that's okay. Um, on Thursday, we'll start competency seven. I think it's okay, because it needs its own day anyway. Um, so this is going to be a, a combination of what we learned yesterday with the spelling stages. Don't forget the spelling stages. Okay. All right. 
All right. So, Brian writes SPCL for the word special. When considering the developmental stages of spelling, Brian uses, what do we remember? He just uses SPCL. For the that's word. abbreviation. And that's going to be what? Don't tell me. It's okay. We are activating prior knowledge. It's not A. You're right. We know it's not A. It's not C. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be D. So remember, with phonetics, they spell it how they hear it. So if it was like because, they would spell it B-E-C-U-Z. Like they spell how they hear, not taking the spelling um, rules <laughs> in consideration. So knowing that, which one would it be? B. Pre-phonetic. There we go. You, but you were thinking through them. This is, I created Quizlet cards, so just go through them. I got you. Going to work yourself out. <laughs> All right. Absolutely correct. So let's look at this explanation. So with this, it says, Brian's spelling reflects the pre-phonetic stage of spelling. He uses some of letter sounds and letter relationships, but does not use vowels in this example. So basically what that means is he was abbreviating a lot, right? And you really couldn't see a lot of the letter sound correspondence because he had little to none, which we know is a characteristic of the pre-phonetic stage. Next. So here we have, during which of the following stages of spelling development do students typically begin to show an understanding of the correspondence between letters and sounds? Phonetic, B. Yes, phonetic. Yes, Abby, love it. Absolutely. A teacher is planning an activity in which students will examine words that contain vowel digraphs and complete a text comprehension activity. They read a list of words and sort them into vowel digraph patterns, then read a short story and mark up the text identifying the vowel digraphs in it. Which of the following is an example of a vowel digraph? So we know what the vowel digraph, it is two vowels that have one sound, and also the rule is that whichever vowel comes first is the one that we hear. That's the long sound that we hear, right? So keeping that into consideration, which one of these vowel digraphs will fit those two characteristics? C? Oh, not sure. A, A, I, and C. Oh, yeah. Um, so said, um, so said is not one of the vowel digraphs. Early, E-A, we don't hear that there. Oh. Um, boat. You can hear strong. Well, it's a long O. The long O, and that's the first um, vowel that we hear. And it's one, so just remember with vowel digraphs that O-A is one of the ones that we hear like all the time. So the O-A in boat, we also saw it in that video is going to be OA. So let's see if they give us some type of rationale. So when we think about AI, um, AI is a vowel digraph in these particular words. Rain, paint, rail. Do you hear the sounds in those? Rain, paint, rail, right? However, it does not follow the rule in words like said or pair, okay? So when we're thinking about the vowel digraph, it lives in these words, not necessarily said or pair. Um, for answer C, OA is a vowel digraph in the word boat. If two vowels are beside each other in a word or syllable, the first vowel is usually long while the second vowel remains silent. Examples are made, sweet, bean, boat. So what I would do is just try to put most of these to like memory. 
Um, I'm going to create some Quizlet cards as well so that that'll be helpful to you. Um, and so let's see. Yep, that's all I have here. Let's move on. Next. All right. A teacher is planning an activity in which students will examine words that contain consonant diagrams. So consonants are the same as vowels. There are two consonants that um, share one sound, right? And complete a text comprehension activity. They will read a list of words and sort them into consonant diagraph patterns. Then read a short story and mark up the text identifying the consonant diagraph in it. Which of the following is, is an example of a consonant diagraph? We have CK and back. We have st and stump and last. And think, does the st, does it make one sound or two? The I, G, H, and light, think. A consonant digraph only has what? Two, um, two consonants that share one sound. Does that match that characteristic? And then puff, once again, does it match the characteristic? So keeping that in mind, a consonant digraph is going to be a, okay, because B is a blend where you can hear two of the letters. You can hear st, S, and T, and stump. So that's more of a blend than a consonant digraph. So let's see. Let's go and look. So I love the introductory uh, commentary, so let's read it. In this question, you're expected to determine which of the letter combination is a digraph. So a digraph is two letters that make one unique sound. Some di digraphs are consonant digraphs, which are two adjacent consonants that make one unique sound. Some examples are ch, th, sh, w, ing, and k. All right, so that's what's important to know here. So the CK is a consonant digraph, Right? A consonant digraph is two consonants that make what? One unique sound. We know the CK makes the k, k sound, right? The ST is not a digraph, it's a blend because you hear both sounds. You hear the S, you hear the T. The I is a trigraph, right? Trigraphs are three letters that make a unique sound. So, night, sight, that is a trigraph. Then um, the two Fs is a tri is not a trigraph. Um, the two F is a spelling pattern that is used because of English spelling rules. So remember, when we're talking about a consonant digraph, it's two consonants that make one unique sound. Okay. All right. So here's the moment of truth. In the word chimpanzee. Which of the following pairs of letters is a digraph? So we're talking about two consonants. A. Absolutely. And sometimes it's literally that simple once we know the definition. All right, so we went over this one. I wanna just whichever ones we didn't go over. Uh, we went over this one yesterday. Is it ready? Okay. So we have, it is early in the school year and Mrs. Jensen wants to develop an activity that will help our fourth grade students communicate more clearly by correctly using the conventions of written English. Of the following, which activity would best accomplish this goal? So I want y'all to talk through it and tell me, um, because we're at the end of this competency, now I want the heavy lifting to be put on y'all. Go and read the question, read the answer choices, and then tell me what answer would you choose.
Okay. Um, I, you, I think I have my answer. Okay. If you, um, cause I, I, I realize sometimes it can be like a lot. If you want to just put your answer in the chat, bo chat box, that okay. would be good as well. All right. And we're going to end on that note. Shout out to y'all. It was correct, right? So students work in groups under the teacher's direction to read through a paragraph containing grammatical and punctuation errors. So we know when students are struggling, um, it's never a good idea to just like leave them alone and say, oh, write as much as you can each day. Does that necessarily help them with what they need help on as far as um, making sure that they're using the conventions of written English? No, we need to make sure they're under the teacher's direction, the teacher can guide them and really help in identify correcting those errors. The same way with C. Now we were talking about which activity would, uh, you know, bring joy into the classroom. Then sure, students keep a journal where they must write every day and exchange um, and correct each other's papers on their ears. But once again, this can be a situation of the blind leading the blind if no one really knows what to look for and what to identify. A special center is set up in the classroom where students complete worksheets on grammatical and punctuation errors distributed at assigned times during the class period. Once again, a center is not necessarily helping the students be successful in identifying where they're struggling at. So nice work, guys. All right, so this is concluding um, competency six. Be sure to make sure you um, head to the Google Classroom, do and look at the spelling stages, right? You also want to make sure I'm going to create uh, Quizlet cards for the diagraphs as well, so you can go over them, be familiar, because you might have one or two questions on competency six about it. Since it's on certified teacher, I'm sure it'll be on the test. So we just want to make sure that we focus on that. All right, so that is all I have for today. Y'all have a great rest of your night. Thank you, do the same. All right, bye.